Hello, uh, welcome to our webinar. Um, if you are looking for the webinar on fun with foraging, how to get started and fun toy ideas with our special guest, uh, Dr. Stephanie Lamb. We will be on with her shortly. Um, let's give people time to log in. And we're gonna do another poll question today. Let's see what we got up um, for today here. Ready and rolling. Today's um, poll question is, all right. Are you currently offering a diet that encourages foraging for your bird, of course? Um, no, not yet. Yes, but not every day. And yes, daily. Let's see here, what do we got going? So it looks like, no, not yet. It uh, has about 33%. So hopefully they'll have some good takeaway ideas from today's webinar. Um, yes, but not every day, about 52%, and yes, daily is at 19%. So maybe we could talk a little bit about the frequency on, on how, how often um, your bird should be foraging um, for its diet, for its food every day. <laughs> um, all righty. So it looks like no, not yet is at 35% and yes, but not every day is at 48% and yes, daily is at 16%. Do any of those uh, numbers uh, surprise you, Dr. Lamb, or are they about what you would think? Is that kind of? About what I would think, you know, and, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that there's more people doing it than, than, um, than people that aren't doing it. And hopefully with uh, this webinar, people get excited to, to start doing more of it. Great. Yes, I know. Uh, once you, you know, once you get in a, like a routine of, of creating some foraging ideas, it's kind of fun. It's like something to look forward to um, when you wake up in the morning, like, what, you know, a little bit of a, a challenge maybe for your bird or just to see them an easy challenge that they, they feel that satisf satisfaction of, uh, satisfied of, you know, like, oh yeah, that was easy. Like, <laughs> just something to mix up their day a bit. Okay, so if you're just joining us, we have a poll question and it is, are you currently offering a diet that encourages foraging? So far we have no, not yet at 32%. Uh, yes, but not every day at 45% and yes, daily at 24%. So I guess that's about, I'm gonna end the poll. Um, that was a short one, but we should have people logged in now. Um, all right, here's the results, ready? And there you go. So yes, no, not yet is at 32%. Yes, but not every day at 45%. And yes, daily at 24%. All right. Thank you for participating in our poll question today. And with that, let's get this webinar started. Um, so once again, uh, the webinar topic for today is fun with foraging, how to get started and fun toy ideas. And of course, our special guest uh, once again is Dr. Stephanie Lamb. Um, she will take it away now. Hi, <laughs> thanks for having me again. Um, so today I wanted to talk about foraging because it's a really fun thing to do with our birds, um, providing them with hours of entertainment, uh, stimulating their minds. It's really a great way to engage our birds that are with us in captivity to exhibit some of the natural behaviors um, that they should be exhibiting if they were in the wild. Um, and, you know, the first thing that we need to discuss is what actually is foraging. Um, foraging is the act of searching for food items or desired objects. Um, and in the wild, birds will spend a large amount of their day foraging for food. Um, they spend a significant amount of time searching all over the place because they don't have a food dish in the wild for them to easily go to um, to get their food. So they have to search all over the place to get different food items throughout the day. Um, and, you know, not only are they needing to search for that food, but they have to be safe while they're searching for food. And so they got to be, um, you know, evading predators, finding things that are safe to eat, breaking into those food items to get to uh, the nutritious portions of the food. And so um, it really takes up a good percentage of their day. Uh, different studies have been done where people have gone out and observed wild birds and looked at their waking hours and seen what percentage of their waking hours are actually spent searching for food and foraging. 
And studies show somewhere around 60 to 70% of a bird's waking hours are spent looking for food, you know, because they don't find all their food in just one spot. They have to fly to other places because maybe some predator comes by and they get spooked and they have to, you know, safely go somewhere else. Or maybe there's a whole flock of birds and they eat up a bunch of stuff in one area and well, now there's, we're still hungry, but we need more and have to go somewhere else. So, um, you know, foraging is really a huge component of a wild bird's daily life. And so in captivity, you know, we think we're making it very nice for them, but for having their food dish in an easily accessible location and uh, easy to reach their, their nutrition, but we are taking away that ability to have to search. So when we look at studies on how much time birds spend uh, looking for their food and getting their food in captivity, it comes to right about like five to 10% of their day. So now we took this 60 to 70% of a bird's day and shrunk it down into a five to 10% portion of their day. And so that leaves them with a lot of time on their hands to do something else. Um, and some birds are really playful and take up that time doing playful activities. Some birds are more perch potatoes and just hang out and relax. Um, some birds, you know, maybe uh, focus more on hormonal things, you know, as we've talked about in a few previous lectures. So, um, you know, they, they end up using up the rest of that day doing something, but sometimes those things that they're doing aren't always the most productive. Sometimes birds get bored, um, and we certainly have seen birds that do things like feather destructive behavior when they're bored, you know, and they're stressed, they want something to do, but they just don't really have anything going on, you know, so it's something that thinking about ways we can encourage them to do these natural behaviors in captivity can be really beneficial to them because it can now take that five to ten percent of the day where they're looking for their food and we can try to stretch it out so that they are having to search for their food or interact with their food items longer um, so that they're taking up more of their day so they're not having these big chunks of time where they could get bored have inappropriate behaviors that they do um, or you know just sit around as perch potatoes doing nothing and maybe just gaining weight um, so you know we want them to be engaged we want them to use their mind they're highly intelligent animals and we want to encourage that with them so there's many different ways that we can think about foraging um, in one way we can think about foraging as the food item itself you know what is it that they're interacting with and and looking for um, and studies have actually been done that have shown when you have a larger food item for birds, they tend to spend more time sitting there manipulating it and interacting with it. So larger food items, and we're just talking about the food in and of itself, do tend to stimulate more foraging time for birds. Um, there are certain products on the market, and Lefebvre's is, you know, probably the main one that has um, those uh, really great um, Nutriberries and Ava cakes and things that are wonderful foraging devices because you have multiple different delicious food items kind of stuck together in this one nice little ball or cake like structure and birds spend more of their time kind of picking through that and manipulating it and interacting with that food item um, to get all the different nutrients that are in there. Um, so, so food items themselves can be a source of, of foraging, um, but then also making birds search for their food items is a great way to encourage foraging. Um, so the stuff that I wanted to kind of really talk about uh, quite a bit today was what sort of fun things can we do with our birds um, to encourage them to forage um, all the way from teeny tiny little guys to the big guys is my, my hope to, to cover today. Um, and a lot of times when I'm talking with owners about encouraging their bird to forage, I usually tell owners, start simple. Um, you can make foraging devices at home. There are foraging devices that you can purchase from pet stores or online. Um, 
but it's always best to start simple because if you have a bird who's never had to really forage before and you give them this really complex thing that they have to figure out to get their food then they might give up you know just like uh, think about a kid um, learning math you know we don't have children starting off learning calculus um, if we had if we gave kids calculus and we're like figure this out a lot of people would get frustrated really easily and wouldn't ever work on it. You'd have some who would, of course, um, but an overwhelming majority would not. Um, that's why we start with real simple things with kids in schools where we're teaching them with math, you know, one plus one, you know, addition and subtraction. You know, we want to think about that same thing with our birds. Start simple and gradually work up to these more complex things. So a lot of times I'll have owners just simply start with their food dish. Um, the birds know where their food dish is. They have always gone to their food dish and gotten food out of it. Um, and, you know, the easiest thing to do is start by um, just covering that food dish up. And so, like, for example, here I have um, just an example of a food dish, just a regular food dish. Um, and I can simply have an owner get some food items, their regular food items if they like, put their food into their food dish, and then do a very simple thing of taking some easy barrier to cover up that food dish. So I usually just use paper because paper is easy. Um, and you can just kind of cover that food dish up. Um, and then because a lot of our, our little food dishes in pet cages, our bird cages can like sit into those little like metal slots. You can just set this right in uh, and kind of crunch it up around that metal slot. Now what the bird has to do is when it walks over to its food dish, it sees this thing in the way. And it's like, what, what's that? And they can like peck through the paper, break it open, and then pull it off. And then once they get it off, oh, there's my food inside. And so it's just this very simple, easy thing to do. For some birds who are even confused by that, having to break through something initially, I mean, you can just crinkle up the piece of paper and like put it on top of the food. So it's in there. And it just at least starts them going, there's something in between me and my food. And they can just pick it up and throw it away. And then they can get to their food um, and just start very simple of putting something over the food so they don't have to move something out of the way to get to their food. Then as it starts to, as they start to do that very easily, and most birds do pick up on that within the first day, just fine, no problems, you start working up from there. And you'll take a couple of pieces of food and you may actually put it into a little piece of paper and crinkle it up. So now you have this nice little food packet and then you can drop that in the food dish. Um, and you do that with all their food. So now they have to pick that thing up and go, wait a second, that has something in it. And then bite into it, manipulate it, tear it open, and then get the food out. And you can see he's getting a little excited because he knows what <laughs> more is. Um, so, you know, you then like do that with all their food. So now they have something a little more complex where originally it was just some easy thing on top. They just had to pick up a piece of paper and throw it away. Now they have to pick this thing up, manipulate it, work through it, but it's all still involving the food dish because they know where their food is. So you start extremely simple. Then once they get that figured out for a couple of days, then you can start taking those pieces of paper that have um, the little bits of food in them and either you can put like a little string around it and like hang it on the side of the cage or you can just sort of stick it between the cage bars sort of close to where the food dish is and if they are used to seeing those things inside their food dish um, then it's very simple if it's sitting right next to the food dish for them to say oh that had food in it when it was in my food dish, probably has food in it now, and maybe I'll check it out and see what it is. You know, so they'll go and they'll investigate and he's doing a great job of showing us how this works. Um, and interact with it and tear it apart. And oh, now we got a couple pieces of food. But one of the key things is to encourage them to keep going. Don't put all their food inside of that little piece of crinkled up, balled up paper, but just a few pieces. So now, okay, I got one or two pieces of food but now I have to keep working. I have to go to other little balled up pieces of paper that I found just stuck between the cage bars um, to get the food that I need for my day. And so now 
were taken up a whole lot more of their time by making them have to just search for these different food items. And you just slowly start over time, as they get used to it picking up close to the food dish, start spreading it out around the cage. So they have to go to the top, the bottom, the side, it's all over the place in different areas that they have to go to get these little packets of food. Ultimately, if you can work up to all their dry food being um, in different foraging things and not in the food dish at all, that'd be awesome because now they always have something to be working on and they're primed to go, I need to search for my food. I've got a job. If I want to eat, I need to go looking for things. I have to do something for myself. Um, so that's a very easy way to start them foraging. And then you can start doing it with other foraging toys. You can purchase toys or you can make toys. Um, I did bring quite a few toys to show um, of toys that I really like um, and different ways that people can have their birds interact with them. But like, for example, you can have something really simple like this little triangle. Um, I believe usually when you buy this, it comes with like a couple little wooden blocks inside. Um, and you can just have this hanging and it can just be simply a toy where there's little wooden blocks inside of there that they have to pull out and they can manipulate. But you can also use it as a foraging toy where you put a piece, couple pieces of their food inside of that. So now they have to, you know, look around in there and get just a couple pieces out. Um, there's other really fun ones where they have like drawers that they have to like open the drawer. Now when you're interacting with something like this, this is a little bit more involved um, because I have to have a food item that goes inside of that drawer there and then shut the drawer. So the bird has to figure out, I need to pull this open to get the food out from inside. So a lot of times when you're first starting to teach a bird how to forage, um, you want to start making it easy for them and have the drawers open and just put the food inside of it. So maybe one or two days of big, making it very simple that you put the food in and leave the drawers open so that they know that this is something they can go to to get food. And then after a few days of them being comfortable with interacting with the device, then you start shutting it, you know, and now they have to figure out, I have to open this up. Um, I have another one very much like it that's drawers up there and I'll see if I can get him to interact with it. But this one over here has multiple different ways that they have to interact with these drawers. So little ones that you push the drawer in back and forth, one that you pull it open, one that swings, um, and one that opens a different way. So if I put all these food items inside of here and close it up, now he has to individually open up each little thing in order to get his food out, you know? And so he has to figure out, or your bird has to figure out how to interact with that particular part of that foraging device. They're all little different drawers, so he has to interact with all of them slightly differently in order to manipulate it and get it to work for him. Um, there's some other little fun ones where like, this one is a drop down one where you can see that there's little slots for food to go in, but you also can sort of trap the food inside of this device. And the harder it is for the person to interact with, sometimes the better, <laughs> because that means it's gonna be a little difficult for the bird too. But you can see um, that you can hide food up inside of there. And now the bird has to like manipulate this piece to get it to drop down appropriately before they can actually get to the food on the inside. There's some really easy ones. There's some really complex ones. Um, these are ones that are designed specifically for birds for foraging, but you can also get some things that are not necessarily designed specifically for foraging with birds. Um, for example, I have just a little like dog toy ball or a kid's ball. Um, I think this is originally like a kid's toy. Um, but I can turn this simple device into a foraging device. And the way that I can do that is again, we have our little pieces of paper with food inside of them that they're used to because we've gotten them used to foraging around their cage. And you put the food inside of that little crinkled up piece of paper, and you can shove it between the um, sides there and now there's food inside of there. So then I can put it down and they can interact with it and try to get it out. Um, you know, different birds are 
going to enjoy certain foraging toys over other foraging toys. Um, but, you know, there's lots of different things that are out there and, and I'd encourage you to, or owners to try a lot of different things. Um, when we look at a lot of these toys, I have had owners before say, well, these are, they're made for, for larger birds and I have a cockatiel or a little conure. You know, I don't know if these will work very well. Um, there are some smaller devices that I've had for my, my tiny little green cheek conure. Like I've got this little thing here. It's got the teeniest, tiniest little hole, um, but I can load food devices, food treats into there and have this hang and he can come over and interact with it. And I have to say, I've been very surprised um, with my green cheek conure. He's only like 62 grams or something like that. So he's a tiny little guy, but I've seen him interacting with like this giant foraging toy that's actually broken because one of them decided to break it, one of my birds, but um, normally it has a little piece that comes out right here. I've literally seen my tiny little conure, this big thing that you see is like my whole hand, takes up my whole hand. I've seen him sit there and spin this thing around and get food out of this. So. Don't underestimate them um, because again, they're really smart and if they're motivated, they will work with some of these things. It's a matter of um, starting small, starting with the easy things so that they gradually learn that I'm looking for my food, I have to search for it, and it's not this easy, simple thing that's inside of a dish. Life is a little bit more difficult. I need to, you know, figure it out. Um, but it's a good thing, you know, it's a great way to stimulate their minds. Um, and so they will surprise you sometimes with the types of things that they uh, interact with and forage with. Um, now, after a bit of time, some birds get really, really used to using certain foraging devices um, and just move through them with ease. Um, and sometimes at that point you go, okay, well, we need to change it up a bit. We need to give them something different. So it's kind of nice to have a few different foraging toys um, that you can rotate through so that you don't necessarily always have the same foraging toy around um, so that you have, uh, you're still working on stimulating their mind in different ways because you're giving them different things at different times. The other thing I really like to do is I like to make my own foraging toys because, you know, each of these toys uh, varies between probably like 10 to $30, depending upon the type of toy that it is um, and how complex it is. Uh, so, you know, that can sometimes get a little bit pricey. Um, so I like to make foraging toys out of stuff that I have at home that I would be getting rid of anyways. Um, and so I'll save things like uh, boxes, like here I have a little bit of a box from like a Coke um, uh, box. Um, and I cut it down, so it was like a like 12 pack Coke thing, I guess. Um, and I cut it down and I made little slits on the side so that I could like push it down and kind of make a closed box. Um, and then I put a little hole in the side because I'm going to use this to clip it to the side of the cage. So what I'll do is I'll open up my box. Um, again, I like to work with folded up pieces of paper because now I'm making it even more complex. You know, originally they just had to get through the piece of paper, but now they're going to not only have to get my one little piece of food that's crinkled up inside this paper, now they have to get it out of this box. Um, and so I'll put a few in there. And then a lot of times I will, there's a few different ways I've actually strung it to this or got it to stick to the side of the cage. I have used the little um, rings before, these little rings and attached them to the side of the boxes and then to the side of the cage. I've used little strips of leather. Right now what I have with me is just a little piece of string um, or twine, I should say. So I'll put my foraging items inside my box, close my box up, and then just loop my little twine around the little holes I made, and then I'll put it on the side of the cage for them to interact with. Um, and then this is kind of nice because this is trash that I was going to be getting rid of anyways, or recycling, and now I am having my bird having something um, that was going to be disposed of that's clean, of course, um, 
that they can interact with. And it doesn't matter because this is something that they can tear this up to as, as much as they want. I don't care. I don't need that box any longer. Um, let them destroy it and have a lot of fun with it. Now, sometimes boxes can be a little bit hormonally inducing for some individuals that they can. Um, they like boxes and want to get inside of a box. So keep that in mind. A box like that may not be the best thing for all individuals, um, but it is something that uh, can be used. And one thing that you can do to kind of make it um, a little less likely to be hormonally inducing is smaller size box. You know, get a box that they can't actually get their whole body into so that you're not encouraging them to be hormonal. Um, I also save like tissue paper rolls um, and uh, paper towel rolls, that sort of stuff. And again, do a very similar thing where I take my little piece of paper, <laughs> put my food inside of it, and then I stuff it inside of the paper towel roll. So again, now I'm just making it more complex and something different to interact with. And Barry is playing with his ball, uh, figuring out how to get that little bit of food that's inside of there, you know? So, so he's got tons of different things to interact with, but they only have just a couple of pieces of food. So again, ultimately throughout the day, all my food is in different things. So he's got stuff to do and he's got his intelligent mind um, occupied so that he's not getting himself into as much trouble. <laughs> Um, and you can just shove it through there. The other thing I've done sometimes is sometimes I've like made little holes in these and like strung up a whole bunch of them, you know, um, to where we have like some nice little mobile sort of thing, you know, and have a bunch of that food inside of them. And that can be a lot of fun too, hanging it from the cage. Um, one thing that I found to be helpful for some of the little guys is there's these little boxes um, that I found at pet stores. Um, and they're, they're just simple little boxes, but they have like uh, paper on the inside of them. Um, and you could make this at home too, if you have some little boxes at home and if you have paper that you shred and could put it inside of there. But this can be nice for the little guys because you could hide like a crushed up Nutriberry inside of there and get them to like you work through it. You know, it's a very simple little thin cardboard box. So that can be really helpful for like little cockatiels or budgies. Um, the other thing that I've done, because I've even foraged with my finches too, um, is for the really tiny guys, I've used um, hay before. So like Timothy hay, um, I have taken Timothy hay and like put it on a plate um, and then put food underneath there, crushed up nutri berries, a little bit of pellets hidden underneath the hay and then had my finches come over and like interact through that um, and like push the hay around and, and get to the little bits of food. So, you know, even these tiny little guys can really have a lot of fun with foraging because, you know, it's a natural behavior that they're wanting to, to uh, exhibit. Um, and so when they get to actually forage, a lot of birds seem so much happier um, and they're having a lot of fun, you know? So, um, now, I, I do also have um, a couple of images for PowerPoint. If you want, I can go ahead and share my screen and I can show you that part of the presentation here. All right. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes. All right. So, um, just a few photos I wanted to show if it'll advance. Hmm. There we go. Okay. Let me go back. Okay. Oh, this was the first slide. Okay. So, um, this is a bird who has never foraged before. Um, this bird has always had its food available to it inside of a food dish. So this, I had this opportunity to um, interact with this bird, work with it, and start working on it with foraging. So this one I didn't start with the typical way I just mentioned of, of doing the piece of paper over the food. This one I started, I'm going to encourage this bird with something that's a little bit more desirable. So what we have here, this is
is just a dog toy, actually, not chewed on by a dog previously. There are chew marks, but those are bird chew marks. Um, this is a dog toy um, that's kind of rubber based and we put a little chain around it. And you can see on the middle image there that I have hidden inside of it, a nice, delicious, wonderful almond. Um, and so originally I didn't have it in there. Uh, the bird's just kind of looking at it, but I put my almond in there and then I hooked it up to this tree and it's hanging inside of there, kind of right at the bottom. So the bird saw it and again, this bird has never foraged before. So it was kind of a little bit like, I would imagine, confused as to why I was sticking some delicious uh, fully shelled almond inside of a toy and not giving it directly to the bird. Um, but, you know, her, her um, excitement and interest got the better of her. And you can see she kind of climbed down a little further to a little bit of a lower branch and reached down and actually picked up that dog toy. Um, and because this is a macaw and a bit larger bird, that uh, dog toy is, you know, okay as far as a, a acceptable foraging option to interact with. And you can see her looking at inside of it and thinking about how do I have to get in there? Here she is pulling it up. She had dropped it again and had to pick it back up. But then she eventually figured it out and she got that, that almond out of there. And because it's a shelled almond, she still had more work to do. She still had to break into that to actually get to the delicious inner portions of it. But rather than me just giving her that almond, unshelled and saying, here you go, you're a good bird. Um, I've given her a job. I've given her something to do. So she's taken up a whole lot more time um, and gotten to use her mind to be really stimulated. And again, this is her first time foraging. So she was probably really excited by herself when she found the wonderful treat at the end. Um, I also had hidden a couple of other toys around uh, the Kate, the the um, tree stand here with some foraging options. I had hidden inside of one of those little um, boxes that I was showing you earlier that are really good for the small ones. Um, I had actually hidden some nuts inside of there and you can see it dangling over here. And actually inside of this little shoe, I had hidden some uh, treats as well. And so she's looking down at it going, I can see that. And she reached it and pulled it right up to herself, started working through it, um, really taking it apart. Um, and then she got her nut out of the center there and you can see like the look on her face. She just looks like she's so excited that, hey, I got this nut out. This is great, you know? So she, you know, got to have fun. She got rewarded in the end for doing certain behaviors that were taking up her time. Um, and, you know, the more you forage with them, the more they get encouraged to keep doing these, these behaviors. Um, this bird, this is Arroyo, uh, my Amazon, who's here with us today. Um, someone had hidden a treat inside of that bag, uh, that little nut bag. There was one uh, nut that they had left inside of there for him, and then they had put it inside of that other bag. Um, so he had to pull the little bag out of the bigger bag and then had to get his little nut out of there. Um, the reason I showed this device is because this little thing hanging behind Arroyo, it just looks like a simple little wooden toy with some holes punched in it. Originally, there were pieces of um, like little sticks inside of there, and he had pulled all those sticks out. That toy was not originally supposed to be any sort of foraging toy. It was just a simple toy with fun things around it. So he played with it as the toy that it was meant to be, but then I kept it around because those tiny little holes are great foraging holes. Um, so, you know, repurposing your toys and turning them into something more than what they were originally meant to be can be great. You know, I can hide the teeniest, tiniest little piece of something inside of there and he can see it and be really encouraged to, oh, I need to get that and, and go after it. Um, this is just some little, uh, something that my husband got from his work. I think it's like a little mailer, um, a little mailer tube. Uh, but you know, so little things that you wouldn't necessarily think of as a bird toy, you can turn it into a bird toy. This little mailer thing that has these two little plastic ends was well, a great foraging device, you know, hide something fun inside of there, give it to your bird. Now the bird has to figure it out, tear it apart, get to the delicious item on the inside. So the, the point of showing this picture is as well, you know, keep your mind open for the different foraging toys and things that, that are out there. There's more foraging opportunities than what is just present as 
things that are supposed to be foraging toys at the pet stores. Um, this was an old baby bottle. I put a toy inside there, but I unfortunately got the picture too late because he already got out what he wanted from it. Um, this picture, it was just sort of showing, again, some foraging toys, uh, but then also uh, demonstrating the boxes that like, I will save little pieces of paper, hiding pellets inside of those, um, and then string up and hang them to the side of the cage. Now, um, kind of back to the using food as foraging options too. As I mentioned in the beginning, the larger the food items or food items that have more textures and um, pieces to them can be really interesting and fun and, and engage that foraging activity. Um, but other things that are fun to forage with are, you know, fresh items as well. So these are clippings from a, um, I think orange tree is your orange tree or lemon tree one of the two um, but a completely safe wood that's appropriate for birds to be able to chew on leaves that are appropriate um, the flowers are safe for them as well um, this was just from some natural clippings um, from a tree in my grandparents yard he saved them for me they don't use any herbicides pesticides or anything like that on their trees that they have so i brought it inside rinsed off just to make sure that there wasn't any um, dirt or anything like that on it, um, but then gave it to him to, to play with and looped it all around inside of his little atom here that we have hanging from the ceiling. Um, and it's a fun thing for him to interact with and, and chew up the different parts of that plant. In the wild, they would be chewing up different parts of plants to get um, various food items. So it's a natural behavior that we're allowing him to do. Uh, here's a picture of one of my finches. So like I said, I like to forage with my finches too and give them opportunities to exhibit these natural behaviors. This is cilantro, actually. This is cilantro when it's already started to flower. Um, so this was pulled from my own garden um, and I put it into the, the cage with my finch and though she's not interacting with it in this moment when I took the picture because every time I tried to get a picture of her actually touching it and interacting wow. with it and doing stuff with it, she'd hop away. Um, so. But, uh, you know, the little birds, they love to interact with this sort of stuff. They'll pull it apart. It's, it's safe, healthy food for them, you know. Um, and you can uh, sometimes spritz these things down with a little bit of water. And some birds like to bathe in the leaves of, of um, uh, produce and stuff, you know. So that can encourage you know, other natural behaviors, too. Um, and then I also gave some to Arroyo as well. So again, some cilantro that I pulled from my garden um, and there he is just sort of uh, chewing it and getting to uh, use his beak on that like thicker, more stemmy part of the cilantro. Again, it's very safe for him, something for him to interact with. If he were in the wild, he would be uh, chewing apart things, you know, similar uh, plant-like items. Um, so it's uh, again, just a great way to encourage them to do normal behaviors. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen right now. All right. All right. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I really love foraging because it's fun for the birds. It gets them to do natural behaviors. It takes up their time um, doing things that they are meant to be doing. Uh, it takes away from time that they might spend doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. Um, it gets them using their mind. It, it's just, it's a really fun thing. And, and there's so many ways you can do it, whether you do it with the food item itself, um, the introducing different types of food items, offering them toys to interact with, different ways to access their food. I mean, there's just so much, so much opportunity with foraging. And really what I like to tell owners when I'm in rooms with them talking to them about foraging is honestly the limit of uh, what you can do with foraging is your own imagination. You know, everything that I'm showing right now is just stuff that I like to do and that's fun, but um, you know, owners come in and tell me about some new foraging toy that they've uh, used with their bird or something that they made that uh, is really fun. And, and gosh, we've tried so many different fun things and uh, you know, everybody's got great ideas for different foraging options. Um, so it's, it's, a really, it's a really fun, fun thing. Um, and just as a fun little side note, um, Arroyo, my Amazon, he's really good at foraging. Um, we started him off from foraging like right away when he was a baby. Um, and he's so good at foraging 
that one time um, I was late at work. It was a, a late night, busy day. Uh, we were probably, he and I were here till, I don't know, maybe 8 or 8.30 at night. And um, he was hungry. He had gone through all his food. And normally he's in bed by 7 o'clock, so he was up a little late. And I guess he was getting a little hungry because uh, he had already gone through all his food for the day. I was busy in the back working on, on doing uh, records and things like that. And he comes with me to work all the time. His cage was up front, and I heard him climb off his cage and was walking down the hallway to where I was. And um, he walked into the back. And he walked over to he walked over to um, the area where we have um, food for for pets in the hospital. He climbed up onto the the um, shelving and everything. He looked through what we had. He found a, a jar of nutriberries. Um, took the top off the jar of nutriberries, grabbed himself a nutriberry, and then was sitting there just enjoying a nutriberry. So he is so good at foraging, he doesn't need me anymore. He can figure out how to um, get around. He'll be completely fine if he is ever, if I'm ever not able to feed him. <laughs> so, um, well, Amazons are real foodies, aren't they? <laughs> yes. <laughs> wow. Wow, that was, uh, and, and Okay, so we, we talked about this offline a little bit, but your Amazon there, he is a, what, what, what species is very quickly, uh, subspecies? So he is a blue front, um, but I guess he is the, the yellow, uh, yellow wing blue front. Um, he's got the teeniest, tiniest little bit of blue, and you're not, from, for anybody watching this webinar and looking at him, you're not going to see the blue that's there. Um, okay. When he was younger, he had a little bit more blue, like when he was a baby, he had a, a, a bit more blue, but now he probably has like maybe three or five feathers that are blue. They're very, oh. very small. <laughs> so. <He's a> cute. <laughs> well, we do have lots of questions for you. Wow. Um, okay. Like, um, this is such a great topic and an important one. Um, so let's, let's throw, I'm gonna throw some questions your way if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, first up is from Tina and she asks, do you have any, uh, um, any other like dollar store items that work well for foraging? I have bought rolls of tickets, coin roll papers, rolls of crepe paper to stuff nuts inside, paper straws, et cetera. Anyone else um, use other cheap alternatives that are still safe? Yeah, those are all great examples. Um, the little Dixie cups um, or you know, similar brand cups um, that are paper cups, you can use those. Um, coffee liners. Um, yeah, honestly, the limits your own imagination. Of course, when you go and you're using stuff that isn't a, uh, typical made for bird foraging device you have to look at it and make sure that okay is this is there anything with this that could potentially be dangerous but you know paper-based products are are going to be safe plastics are pretty safe don't use any like um anything that's metal wires those sort of things because we worry um about potential toxicities you know could anything have lead in it zinc that sort of stuff that if they chewed inappropriately could be um, toxic for them. But, you know, papers, plastics, uh, and as long as your bird doesn't uh, chew any plastic things and swallow them, you know, that's the other thing too, is you have to be mindful of your individual bird and what they like to do with things when they're in their mouth, um, making sure that they don't swallow things inappropriately. Um, but yeah, you, there's there's tons of fun things that, that you can find at, at uh, dollar store items that are, that are great, so. Okay. Um, and then I have a question from uh, Mary Beth. She asks, does it matter what kind of paper you use to wrap food? Um, are there any particular paper types to avoid? Um, you know, that's a very good question. Uh, a lot of people have been concerned about um, papers that have dyes on them. You know, um, I have to be completely honest and say I've never seen a problem with papers that have dyes on them. So like, you know, like the mailer things that you get in the mail or like in the newspaper, how they sometimes have those like glossy um, papers that are colored. I've never seen a bird actually have a problem with those before. So um, it's something that people talk about, but I don't really know that's a real problem. Um, to be as safe as possible using the like new basic newspaper is fine. I've never had a bird have problems with ink. Yes, sometimes they get ink on their feathers and they may look a little messy, but um, never had any like problems associated with it. So, so I don't have any specific papers to tell you to avoid um, because it really, I think some of the fears that are out there are 
just sort of anecdotal and maybe not really based on something that's um, really been established in a problem. But if you want to be extremely safe, newspapers, just white paper, butcher paper, um, those are fine options. Okay. And, and also, I, I believe um, a bird might not like a maybe like a thick paper or not, not not like immediately take to a thick paper, maybe maybe go a little bit thinner and then they they take to that. So kind of try different paper types if you're burning. Yeah, first different time. textures and thickness. Exactly. Yeah, because you might, or, you know, depending upon your species, like maybe a macaw would be really excited about that, like thicker cardboardy like paper, you know, uh, that these were packing inside boxes. Um, but maybe not so much for a cockatiel, you know, maybe they need the thinner stuff to tear apart. So cockatiels in my my experience, they like the really like ones they can ball up like like uh, tissue paper, like thin, right? Is that that's yeah, that's my, yeah. My, yeah. Um, all right, and I got a question from Barbara. She asked, "What is the name of the toy that is attached to the carrier?" Um, I'm gonna guess it's that plastic. one. Yeah, I'm gonna guess that one. You know, I honestly don't know the name of it, but it's a it's a I can show it a little bit more. I like that um, it it's clear because it, it almost kind of gives the bird a preview of what it's like a it little does, bit. Of yeah. And and some of the some of the foraging toys, you know, that's one of their benefits is a lot of them are clear um, to allow the bird to be encouraged to see. Oh, there's something inside of there. And then some of them are more opaque. Um, and so you know, the more opaque ones may be better for those individuals who are more skilled at foraging. Um, because they know that they need to work with different items. But it's, it's this like four piece thing. Um, I actually don't know the name of it, so I apologize, but you can kind of see it there. I, I've, I purchased this from a bird specific pet store. Um, so going into probably your local bird store okay. should have access. If we find out, we'll put it on, we'll put on lefebvre.com for the uh, okay. little, web, uh, little web webinar announcement page for this webinar. Um, okay. All right, so I got a question from Shona. So if we're supposed to encourage foraging, do we not put food in all the, their dishes? Should we use high reward treats for foraging like nutri berries or almonds or cashews or little pieces? It's a great way to get them started is those high reward items. You know, if you really want them to work with a new foraging toy, um, if you're first starting out with it, yes, you know, those high reward items are going to be great things to start off with to encourage that initial interaction with the toy. But ultimately, if you can get all their food uh, in foraging devices, it's great. Now, where you might have a little bit of difficulty is if you're, you know, doing fresh items that may have moisture, like some vegetables or, or um, fruits, um, because you can't wrap those up in like paper very easily without making a mess. Uh, but you can, you can put them inside of some foraging devices like these little drawer ones, or you can string those on like little skewers um, and hang those from a, a center portion in the cage that they have to like get to in a different way. Um, so you can forage with those more moist food items, um, but just be mindful that those aren't going to last very long, that you do have to keep, uh, you have to change those out if the bird does not interact with those. Those need to be removed from the cage within about two, three hours of being placed in the cage. Okay, and uh, this is kind of a good lead in then to this next question. Uh, Robert asks, how uh, would you use paper for foraging when a bird is hormonal? Would you remove it after a certain amount of time? Yes, so you can remove it after a certain amount of time. Or the other thing too is, um, making sure like if you're using a box and you're putting paper inside that box, make sure the bird can't get inside of the box. So a smaller size box than the bird. Um, and then yes, only having the paper for like short periods. Uh, once they figure out the food, then they kind of get in the, the paper out of the way. Um, but if they're really, really, really hormonal, then that might be where those plastic foraging toys um, are gonna be a little bit more appropriate during those times of year when they're feeling really hormonal. Okay, and um, oh, sure, uh, sure has a, uh, sorry if I'm saying the name, um, sure has a quite, uh, actually a suggestion. Just wanted to say that I've used uh, the printing press and rolls from local newspapers for years, usually oh. they're free, and get to know the guys in the print shop and take them cookies, <laughs> a little bri bribery gets you something there. Um, they're often two weights and it's um, unused paper. So it's heavier weight works great for macaws. So that's a great tidbit right there. Awesome, great. Uh, I'm sure macaws can tear through paper like nobody's business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, so then I got a question, or a question from uh, Tamia asks, does the size of the bird matter on how much they want to forage? Do bigger birds 
do it more? That's a great question. So I think people think that bigger parrots tend to forage more, but what about the little guys too? Um, I, I really, I have to say in my experience, I, I have seen all sizes of birds forage. It's just finding what is most desirable for that bird and working with it. You know, so like what I was saying with the finches, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to give my finch, you know, the the, the foraging device that has the drawers because they can't literally, you know, push that piece of plastic up with their beak. Their beak isn't designed to grasp and pull it. Um, but using, like I said, the hay to cover up some food is perfect. Or, you know, I could have used those strips of cilantro to cover up food, that sort of stuff. So it's just kind of knowing what the um, natural history is of that particular species and working with it because if they were in the wild they would be having to search for their food so we just have to think what can i do for this individual that i have in front of me it's going to vary from one species to the next okay because i remember um i used to uh, kind of crumble up millet spray on the bottom of my bird's play stand and then cover with paper and they'd kind of like a search and you know search mission they'd walk around and yeah and pick up little pieces it was kind of like ground foraging but on the play stand level. Yeah. A little bit of paper on top and that was the challenge. <laughs> yeah that, that's fine that's a great way to start them on that you know. Um, okay so I have Glenna asks my parakeet doesn't use his feet. Uh, parakeet nutri berries are too hard for him to eat. Any ideas? Well okay so one thing with the, the nutri berries that's always helpful for the little guys that I like to because I, I use nutri berries for my um, finches is I crush them up. So I don't even give them the Nutriberry as the berry itself. I actually crush it up so it is sort of the individual little seeds. Maybe a couple of them are stuck together, but for the most part it's it's crumbled up. Um, and then a lot of them will eat it fine that way. Um, so yeah, that's if, if we if if your little guy isn't able to really get into a position to manipulate it because of his own individual issues, then then crushing him up a little bit for him so that maybe they're his microcosm uh, Nutriberry where it's just like a couple little seeds stuck together might be good. <laughs> okay, uh, and then uh, Robert asks, uh, is PVC safe? Is PVC safe? Yeah, yeah so if, it, uh, that's fine. You can use PVC, it's safe. Um, if it gets heated, then, then like if you're working with PVC piping and you're building something and making something and it's heated, that's when it could potentially be an issue. But as, as using like, PVC piping to like hide food inside of, no, that's totally safe. That's completely fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, let's see what else we've got here. Um, okay, Amy asks, uh, are you gonna share links on information on what brands of toys these are and where we can get them? <laughs> I can always do that. We'll yeah. figure out what that first one is. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll try to figure out the names. I'm sure I can get that information quickly. <laughs> okay. Um, and let's see, we do have a lot of questions. Uh, okay, uh, Tamia asks, how often should you let them use the foraging toys? Should you give them more than one toy at a time? Also, can you use plastic bottles to make safe foraging toys? These are good questions. Yeah, so um, personally, I think it's completely fine to have foraging toys, and I encourage people to have foraging toys and multiple foraging toys available all the time. With my own birds, I probably have like three or four plastic foraging toys up in a cage uh, every day. I will cycle through them because I have a whole bunch of them um, and and uh, rotate them through like maybe they get changed every three, four weeks, something like that. Um, and then uh, the second part of the question was the plastic bottles. Yes. Yeah. I think that's fine. And I, I, I had this one picture that I wanted to put on the PowerPoint and I couldn't find it of, of Arroyo um, forging from a water bottle where someone had put a, a, a nut inside of a water bottle for him. Um, well, so with a couple pieces of paper, so it wasn't like he just had to take the water bottle and flip it over and have the nut come out. Um, they put the nut, a couple pieces of paper, so there's a little bit of difficulty in it. And then they even screwed the top back on and gave it to him. And he screwed, unscrewed the top. Um, and then he was so cute because he like put his beak on the end and was like tilting it up. So like the, this bottle was like tilting up and he was trying to get the, the nut to come down into his mouth. And he eventually got it to work, but it took him a while to get it, which is great because again, it's just taking up more of his time. So yes, uh, water bottles are fine to use. Oh, that's funny. Um, you know, I, so just going back to the, how long in the cage, um, 
do you recommend that you remove the foraging toys so they're not there like overnight or is it something that you can leave in depending on the toy um, in the cage? It depends on the, the toy. Um, I do leave mine in overnight, but I, I, I don't use, when I'm feeding my birds their fresh items, I, I tend to not put them inside of their plastic foraging devices. Again, you could if you wanted to, I just don't. But if somebody did do that, those, those are ones that you're definitely going to then want to take them out after a few hours uh, because you don't want those fresh items sitting out and going bad. Like so. a blueberry or a, so like a. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like a melon or something, you know, um, or like some, you know, those like cook and serve foods where um, like people uh, mix uh, water in with, with um, like beans and oatmeals and things like that um, and make like little porridgey sort of things. Um, same thing with those. You don't want those sitting out for, for long hours. You could put them in the foraging devices. There's nothing saying you can't. I just personally don't. So. Okay. So Daniela asks, um, I'd also like to get tips on the types of paper or cardboard to use that are safe. For example, no glue or harmful dyes. So cardboard that would not have So, glue. so um, that goes back to like the, the butcher paper is really safe. Um, regular white paper and, and newspaper. And the, the one person who commented earlier from the printing factory, uh, where she got the ends of the rolls that, that had, don't have any print on it, um, that would be fine. Okay. Oh, this is a good question. Uh, so Karen asks, is there a list anywhere of the safe plants to use for foraging? I, I think on Le Faber Vet, I thought that there was we, one. We will, we will look into that. If we don't have it up there already, that's definitely um, a helpful list to have, uh, at least a starter list of, yeah. of uh, plants that, that you can use. Yeah. There, there are a bunch. I mean, and there's I know. ones to apply, right? So. Yes, I, I had written, um, there is a paper up there on Lefebvre's site that I had written about foraging with fresh, and I listed some safe um, plants that can be um, used for foraging with birds, um, but I believe also on Lefebvre Vet, which we could probably pull from there, there is a yeah. nice list of safe plants for birds. Great. Yeah, that's something that will definitely, um, be, that's good information for people to have. Uh, and also set, uh, safe preparation, because you mentioned earlier that, you know, you have to know your source of where the plant is so yeah. that it hasn't been sprayed with pesticides or you know, you don't want to just go on the side of the road on someone's yard and take some of their clippings because yeah. <laughs> they're going to be afraid, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And also maybe even edible flowers. I mean, that's something yeah. that... Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, um, oh, this is funny. So, uh, Robert points out, he says, Arroyo almost looks like he's part double yellowhead. <laughs> is it <laughs> hybrid? Because I, I, when I first saw Arroyo, I was like, no, that's like a double yellowhead, but from, the, but from my little screen here, so... Yeah. Yep. He likes to confuse people. <laughs> yeah. He's definitely a forager. Boy, he certainly likes to forage, um, which is really cute to watch in the background here. Uh, so Deborah had a suggestion. Um, so making paper mache items is easy to do, and you can dye them with food coloring. Uh, oh. Rolls or boxes can be filled with fresh stems and, or rolled up individual papers with treats. Um, balloons make different and interesting shapes for them to explore as well. I, I, I think she might mean um, using a balloon to make a paper mache. Well, maybe, yeah. I can imagine maybe the bird being a little scared by a regular balloon accidentally popping it. <laughs> uh, but probably, yes, maybe inside of the paper mache thing and molding around it is probably yeah. what she means. <laughs> uh, but that, yeah, that's a, that, that, that is interesting. The paper mache, I know that they, there's a company that had the, um, the little pinata, the little um, bird um, say. Oh yeah. Um, I have used those before. One of my, my greys actually loves the pinatas. <laughs> those are great for celebrating your bird's birthday, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see if we, we're, we're almost out of time for questions, but we're going to try to squeeze in one or two more. Um, Kaylee asks, is there anything we should specifically avoid? That's a great question. As far as materials when making or buying foraging toys. You mentioned so, lead items and wires yeah. and... Exactly. Any things that are metal wires, especially like the bendable ones, just be very cautious of those. Um, 
you know, I, I think it kind of, like I said, the papers and the plastics are going to be generally pretty safe, but definitely know your bird. If you know that your bird chews a plastic that's like softer plastic, you know, these harder plastic items, these are fine because I can't really like, most birds are not going to chew these and swallow it. It's going to be very difficult to do something like that. But the softer plastic items, you do have to be a little bit cautious of, um, or rubbery items, you have to be somewhat cautious of, but know your bird. Your, some birds may be completely fine with those things and not be prone to swallowing things like that. But if you do have a bird who is at all prone to uh, chewing things and swallowing things inappropriately, then the softer plastics and rubber things do be cautious of those. Okay, and that kind of ties in with this next uh, question from Melissa. So what happens if they ingest some paper? Um, and first of all, how would you know if your bird actually ingested the paper? I've always been curious about that. Would there? Well, you know, as, if so if they're, as far as if, how do you know that they've ingested the paper, I guess initially just watching them, how they interact with their, their foraging devices. Um, and seeing what they do. Most of the time birds are going to grab that piece of paper, drop, you know, get the food out of the piece of paper and drop the paper down. Um, they may go back to investigate the paper, see if there's anything else left in there and chew it up a little bit more. But if they do happen to ingest a little bit of paper, paper is um, easily digestible by the gastrointestinal tract. Um, as long as your bird, and I've never seen it happen, uh, isn't like sitting there just totally just gorging on paper, that would be inappropriate. And that was when you would have to say, okay, this bird should not maybe have the foraging devices of having the food wrapped up inside of paper. This bird might, again, do better more with those hard plastic foraging devices that they have to interact with. But um, if they ingest a little bit of paper, it's fine, it's safe, it's gonna be broken down by the gastrointestinal tract and not be a problem for them. Okay. Um, and then, so Karen asks if you have any particular median in which you grow safe plants. For instance, is Miracle Grow, uh, grow Dirt safe to use to, to grow your plants? Um, well, so I have to say for my plants, I use, um, I go to a nursery that's close to me and I actually get, um, their potting soil that's meant for vegetables. Um, I haven't used the Miracle Grow brand. Um, I, I use this more organic brand that they have. Um, I don't know if there's any chemicals in the Miracle Grow, so I can't comment on that part of it. Now, you don't want your bird to eat the soil because sometimes in these soils they may have um, higher amounts of certain. Um, minerals, um, sodium, phosphorus, that sort of stuff that could potentially be irritating to the gastrointestinal tract. So you don't want your bird to eat the soil, um, but growing the food uh, should be fine. I mean, if it's, it's uh, as long as it's rinsed off before you give it to them, um, you know, it doesn't have any of that soil on it, you, it shouldn't be a problem. I, I don't know, like I said specifically about the miracle growth, there's any chemical portions to it that could potentially be bothersome, but potting soil that's meant for vegetables and herbs is meant to be safe for us as well to eat those food items when we grow them. So those should be safe and appropriate. Okay. I think, uh, I think that's all we, oh wait, sorry. Someone had a comment. Uh, <laughs> sadly, the pinatas are no longer being made by pinata toys, but uh, those sure were cute and uh, maybe we'll see them on the market sometime soon. <laughs> maybe, maybe someone else will start making them. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, gosh, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, I thank you for um, all who submitted questions. If we didn't get to your question, we'll, we'll you know, we'll, if you put it in the Q&A button here, we can capture email and send you an answer back. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Lamb, once again, another great uh, topic to present to our audience. Totally appreciate your time and going yeah. over those. And and the little guy in the background is uh, just adorable. Uh, good, a good job on the uh, arroyo on the the foraging demonstration for us. We uh, we all appreciate that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so, okay, so uh, can't wait to see what next topic you have for us. Um, and next week, um, we have next Friday, as a matter of fact. Um, I'm going to re reunite it for, for, with one of my fellow, uh, one of my columnists uh, at Bird Talk Magazine, uh, Diane Grindle. She was the uh, for many, many years, the, the small bird columnist for Bird Talk. 
and she's going to be our guest. She's going to be talking, um, actually, she's going to do something kind of unique. She's going to be drawing. She's a very good and uh, talented uh, drawer. Um, she's going to sketch small birds, and as she's sketching them, she's going to give us some insight on, you know, everything you want to know about your small, about small birds. Um, so don't forget to join in uh, next Friday for that. And then also I want to tell our audience that we do have that special webinar coming up with Dr. Pepperberg. Um, it's been, uh, it originally was going to be this Sunday, but we're going to have it. It's, it's going to be on um, Sunday, next, uh, the sun, sorry, after, Sunday, um, August. Uh, let me make sure I give you the right date here. Um, but this is going to be a really um, special webinar to raise money for the Alex Foundation. So if you're familiar with uh, Dr. Pepperberg's work with um, Alex the African Grey, now she has Athena and Griffin as her, um, as you know, her uh, Alex's uh, flock mates and her muses on, on her research. Um, we will have that special webinar on um, August the uh, 23rd. Um, so uh, we'll keep a lookout for our newsletter for uh, all our webinars that we that we have um, on the site. And um, I guess that's all we have time for today. So. Once again, thank you, Dr. Lamb. Appreciate it, as You're always. Welcome. And to everyone who joined us today, thank you. Hopefully you'll be back with us for our next book great webinar. Um, until then, everyone have, be healthy, be safe, and all the best to you and your flock. Bye. Bye.